Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part four. And this is the final part of our CT evaluation of liver masses, key differential diagnosis findings. And I hope you enjoyed the first three parts. Now, I left off here showing you some examples of hepatoma and some of the pitfalls. And again, this is an example of a patient who has a mass in the liver, there's some neovascularity present, the stretching of the vessels. Again, looks like a tumor shown better on venous phase imaging. Looks like a malignant tumor. It looks like hepatoma. At PATH, this was a hepatoma arising from hepatic adenoma. So it's important to recognize that spectrum. I mentioned before, there's a lot of work being done on genetic markers, trying to figure out which hepatic adenomas have a risk for developing hepatomas or becoming hepatomas, and which do not. So there's a lot of work in that regard. You can see some of the changes in this case as sequela of prior bleeding. I mentioned before also about hepatomas, they're more common in cirrhotic livers. Here's a markedly cirrhotic liver with a vascular lesion in the right lobe, consistent with hepatoma. Remember we mentioned incidental lesions in the liver are very common, cysts, hemangiomas are two good examples, but you're not going to see many cysts and you're surely not going to see hemangiomas in cirrhotic livers where those blood pools are collapsed because of the fibrosis. This shows you nicely that MIP imaging can make lesions stand out better. So if you're going to do anything at a minimum, at least look at the MIPS when you're looking at the liver to look for vascular lesions. And then you also see the vascularity, the neovascularity, which points you to a lesion. Sometimes you only see really abnormal vessels and the mass can be very subtle, but then you at least know you need further imaging or you need a biopsy, so very important. And again, here it very nicely shows you the tumor extension by the portal vein, the extensive varices that are present, or sequela of a patient with cirrhosis. Another example, low density lesion right lobe, no, do not consider hemangioma, cirrhosis, portal hypertension. You look at the lesion, the vascularity, the central low density, again seen. And again, you see a little bit of irregular vascularity when you look at the lesion right here. So that I think all becomes very important. This was a hepatoma. It's gonna be a hepatoma till proven otherwise. You can argue, how do I know it's not a MET? Okay, that would be possible. But a cirrhotic liver, mass, some enhancement, and there's a range of enhancing patterns, but I'm thinking hepatoma. Now, patients with history of NASH, sometimes it can be difficult. You can overcall or undercall the presence of hepatic lesions, but here you see fatty liver, and then, is this normal liver? Is there some blush here? Is there a mass? You need to be careful. You see, as you go to the venous phase, the mass is much more obvious, and that was a hepatoma arising in a liver with NASH. So at times, particularly with diffuse fatty infiltration, picking up both primary tumors and metastatic disease can be a bit trickier, so you need to be very, very careful. And you can see how subtle the lesion can be, particularly on late venous phase imaging as the lesions wash out. Sometimes looking at the reconstruction, seeing the reconstruction, seeing things in a plane beyond the axial, as in this case, makes things a lot better. Now, hepatic steatosis, again, I'm not gonna speak about that. I speak, I'll speak about that in a parenchymal liver talk. But again, things you need to worry about is this progression to cirrhosis, liver failure, and potential increased incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, in terms of liver tumors, people usually say malignancy, hepatoma, metastasis, okay? I mentioned angiosarcoma also, but those are exceedingly rare. But there are some tumors we don't think about, but we see not infrequently. This patient presented with fever, abdominal pain, you see multiple low density lesions in the liver, but you also see multiple masses of the spleen. There's also peripancreatic nodes. One of the things we often don't think about is lymphoma. Lymphoma commonly infiltrates the liver, but beyond the large liver, you often don't see masses. But here you see very nicely the infiltration of the liver. You can see the adenopathy. You can see the spleen. The patient had elevated liver functions. As you go to the narrowing of the window in arterial phase, the lesion showed better in arterial than venous phase. 
And, but you see it here nicely as well. Now you can say, well, peripheral enhancement, is this some fatty liver, what's going on here? This is infiltration of the liver by tumor, and this was lymphoma. So I think you need to think about lymphoma. When you have a disease that gives you liver and splenic lesions, yes, you could say sarcoid, but then you need chest findings. Yes, you can see metastasis like melanoma, possible. But again, think of primary lymphoma. Typically, B-cell lymphoma can involve the liver and spleen with multiple lesions present. Here's another example, multiple low-density lesions in the liver, multiple low-density lesions in the spleen, and multiple nodes in the peripancreatic and paraortic zone. You may or may not see involvement of the kidneys. You can see multiple organ involvement in that regard. But again, liver and spleen, especially in the presence of nodes, and in this case, the nodes, particularly in the left periodic region, are substantial. You've got to be thinking about lymphoma. Just a really nice example. And here's just a few more images. Usually on venous phase, you will see it better, though you can see it nicely on the arterial phase as well. And here's that same patient with multiple lesions present on the uh, patient's cinematic rendering. Again, the cinematic rendering really accentuates the various tumors in both the liver and the spleen. Now, primary hepatic lymphoma is a rare primary liver tumor. Uh, since chemotherapy is a treatment of choice for lymphoma, um, you really need to make the right diagnosis. But again, it's really a challenging diagnosis. It's rare, that's part of the problem, and the hepatomas and mets are more common, but it's something you need to think about. Now, the incidence of hepatic involvement in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is around 20% or so, but often it's very hard to see the involvement of the liver because it's an infiltrating process. In this article by Steller, at initial presentation, a third of patients presenting with a solitary liver nodule while other third have multiple lesions and the remaining have infiltration. What this article basically says, there are three appearances for lymphoma of the liver, diffuse infiltration, solitary nodule, and multiple nodules. Another example here, nice example of multiple splenic lesions and a large dominant hepatic lesion on arterial phase imaging, nicely shown on the 3D mapping with the splenic lesion. And again, as you go to venous phase, the lesion is even easier to see, hepatic and splenic, no adenopathy. You go through that differential, but lymphoma needs to be there. And here's the PET scan of that patient, really nicely showing you the liver and splenic involvement. Another example, the liver looks irregular. Maybe it's just texture changes in cirrhosis. The hepatic artery is really splayed and stretched. When you go from arterial to venous, venous being on your right, look how obvious the multiple lesions are. It's kind of impressive sometimes how on arterial phase imaging, if you stare at the images, you can see some low density, but you're thinking maybe it's textural change, maybe it's some infiltration, not multiple masses. And so venous phase may prove to be much more helpful where there are numerous masses present. Again, in this case of primary lymphoma, of the liver, you don't see any splenic involvement. So just a really nice example of that disease process. Another case, there's something infiltrating the caudate lobe, this intrahepatic duct dilatation. Perhaps it's a cholangiocarcinoma. That's a good thought. The spleen is big. And now you see this infiltration around the portal vein. There's some duct dilatation. Cholangio is not a bad possibility. Gallbladder cancer with extension to the peripancreatic region and port is not a bad extension, but lymphoma is also good to think about. You'll notice we like to say lymphoma displaces vessels. Here it infiltrates the hepatic artery and encases it and splays its branches. Here's another patient, multiple liver lesions, a lesion in the patient's left adrenal, and again, this was lymphoma. There's also, when you look carefully, infiltration of the tail of the pancreas. So multiple organ involvement. You may get primary lymphoma of the liver, but most cases with liver involvement, you're gonna see multi-organ involvement. And so this case, liver, right kidney, lower pole, the patient's adrenal, the patient's pancreas. Again, multi-organ involvement is a very common appearance 
of this disease entity. Just a beautiful example. And again, you can think about metastasis. You can say, well, maybe it's a renal cell with METs. You can go through all sorts of possibilities. And I'm not saying not to do that. But what I'm saying is you got to think about lymphoma because it's often undiagnosed or misdiagnosed early. And early therapy can be a lifesaver in these patients. And again, just a few more images showing you how nicely you could see on venous phase imaging multiple hepatic lesions. And you really see them nice here as well on the cinematic rendering. Just a beautiful example of the patient's primary tumor. Now, the last thing I'll mention are abscesses. And again, I like to speak about abscesses when I speak about a talk on parenchymal liver disease. But I mention them here only because abscesses can often simulate tumors. There's a range of abscesses from pyogenic to amoebic to parasitic to fungal. Some of them have a good history. Fungal patients are immunosuppressed. Amoebic abscess, foreign travel are two good examples. Hepatic abscesses like this one. This was a patient homeless in Baltimore. I looked at this. The first thing I thought about was a primary tumor or metastatic disease, maybe colon cancer. This ended up being a large hepatic abscess. So the point that we'll make is hepatic abscesses can really look like primary tumors and particularly in a patient with little follow-up, patient we know little about, you can easily make that mistake. With hepatic abscesses, pyogenic abscesses are typically caused by a hematogenous spread from GI tract, ascending cholangitis, and superinfection of necrotic tissue. Most commonly, it's E. coli, and patients present with fever, right-sided abdominal pain, weight loss, and elevated liver function tests. Here's a great example of a tumor left lobe of liver, or it looks like a tumor, infiltration, tiny air bubble. What is going on in that left lobe? Could it be lymphoma? I guess compared to what I showed you before, it's not that much different. It looks like an infiltrating process. Well, this was eventually biopsied because we thought it was a tumor. This ended up being a large abscess. So I'm showing you these liver abscesses because they're often great mimickers. Here's another example. A patient was a febrile, had this mass. You start the million dollar workup. Could it be colon cancer? Could it be, in theory, hepatoma? Well defined metastatic disease from some other source. This ended up not being any of that. Here it is on the cinematic. It ended up being an infectious etiology. So liver abscesses can easily confuse you. Now, obviously, sometimes you have a better history. Patient with liver transplant is immunosuppressed. You see a low-density lesion. You still want to exclude malignancy because maybe it has, you know, PTLD, where you get tumors in patients post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, big spleen, stent, and common duct. But this was a liver abscess in a transplant patient. You could see how abscesses are great mimickers, and we're always worried about tumor but you need to think about abscesses as well. Pyogenic abscesses, single or multiple in number, a variable size from several millimeters to several centimeters, and can contain septations of gas uh, with, or within the lesion, but less than 25% of liver abscesses have air. I mentioned amoebic abscesses. Again, could this be a tumor? Yes. Right lobe, younger patient, no known primary, well-defined, multiple cystic lesions, which have this cluster sign on more of a delayed image, more late venous, beautiful for amoebic abscess. So I've gone through many things. I've gone through a range of tumors. I've talked about some pitfalls. I've showed you some complications like bleeding. I've showed you some of the pitfalls like with abscesses. So the thing is, lesion detection alone is not enough. Saying there's a mass in the liver, I guess you can get paid for that, but it's not very helpful to the clinician. And creating a long differential diagnosis of all 30 things it could be is probably not a strategy either. So creating a decisive diagnosis is the key. And that's what we try to do. And I think if you follow all of the steps I mentioned, you will be able to do that. Again, key things, optimal protocols, multi-phase acquisition, fast injection rate, post-processing, 
and then knowing the specific signature of the various lesions so as not to confuse them. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you found this talk helpful. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.